Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this evening. I want to thank the C21 uh, people for their, for their uh, invitation. And uh, allow me, if you will, I'm going to try and paint an Advent triptych. Uh, three stories, one called Light in Darkness, the other one called Darkness in Light, and finally the third one, Giving Birth. But first, an introduction, if I may. My birthday is on December 25th, on Christmas Day. I was born 12-25-1959, so you guys are doing the math already. That makes me uh, on the brink of 63. I look older, I know. But that's where my messianic complex began, being born on Christmas Day. <laughs> and every year, my mother used to tell me the story. She'd tell me how my parents went to Mass on that morning, and they, uh, after Mass, they asked the priest to bless my mother's bump, and uh, they lit a candle, and as my mother was leaving the church, she said, wouldn't this be a beautiful day to have your child born? And of course, dutiful and obedient as I always am, I arrived prematurely, a few days prematurely, uh, at, at 9.30 that evening. My parents planned on calling me Liam Gerard, okay? But because I arrived on Christmas Day, they had to change the plan and they called me Liam Noel. I'm always glad I was born on that day, even though as none of us I can decide the day of our birth. I grew up in a small, small village uh, in the middle of nowhere, okay? Uh, it's right in the center of Ireland. People who know Ireland are familiar with many of the, the coastal counties, and they tend to be rather, rather beautiful, if a little bit savage. But uh, where I'm from is the, the most inland point. I joke that I am from the Iowa of Ireland. Anyway, um, the, my home is the next property to our village church. It's small, it's humble, and I am so glad that Unusually, I was actually ordained in that church uh, 37 years ago. And uh, going to the church, we have a wonderful Christmas custom that I always liked as a child and still continue, even here in Boston. When we go to visit the Christmas crib, we take a handful of straw and we bring it home. And what do we do? We put it under the mattress on our bed. Okay, and the idea is that as Jesus was born 2,000 years ago and laid in the manger, so too, if you like, uh, we, uh, he is born to us and we are born with him. Uh, I teach sacramental theology, as you heard, and of course, particularly, I constantly tell my students that sacraments are not about just remembering the past, but sacraments are about reactivating the power of those events in the present. So for example, you know, uh, the uh, Easter, which comes from the Jewish feast of Passover. Passover uh, is a time when the Jewish people believe that the saving power of that very first night touches them again. And again, in our, in our Easter liturgy, uh, I, I don't know if you, any of you have ever been to the Easter vigil, but it keeps the, the beautiful exalted hymn at the beginning, keeps saying, this is the night, this is the night, this is the night. And it's, what it's telling us is that as we recall those events of 2,000 years ago, their power touches us now. Uh, those of you who have uh, uh, sat through my, a class recently with me will know that my favorite movie is that beautiful French movie called Of Gods and Men. Uh, it's set, uh, it, it's a true story, and uh, there's a beautiful Christmas Eve uh, scene in it. And there is a, a monk in the movie who is making a very difficult decision. And in the movie, he brings the Christ child, the baby, in procession and places it in the, in, in the, in the, uh, the crib or the creche. And it's, an, it's, it's like it's a metaphor for what's happening with him, okay? Uh, the, the, the Christ is taking hold of him and the power of Christ is directing his life. So Jesus being born again 
in, in, in our world. Anyway, that's the kind of the introduction. So scene one, light in dark. So let's go back to that village church where I, where I grew up and tell you a story that happened to me there many years ago. I was seven or eight years of age at the time. And the rule in our family home was, you didn't leave the house after dinner in the evening. But you probably know better than I do that rules are made to be broken. And I remember on this particular evening, walking down the sidewalk from our home, to the parish church, which is only 200 yards away. It was winter time, and I remember crossing the, uh, the cemetery that surrounded the church, where all my ancestors are buried. I remember going up to the back door of the church, pushing it open, and standing into the church. And of course, immediately as I did, the door swung closed behind me. And immediately I knew that I was trapped, okay? I couldn't reach the, the, the handle on the door because I was even smaller then than I am now, and I, and I couldn't re reach up to it. Nor could I call because I wasn't meant to be there. So I didn't know what to do. And I remember turning around and facing the darkness of the church. There was a side door. Maybe that would be open. So I remember walking up the center aisle of the dark church, putting one foot in front of the other, hoping and praying that I would not bump into anyone, anything, whatever. And halfway up the church, I saw something that absolutely startled me. No, it wasn't an apparition. It wasn't a vision. It was something that was and is always in our churches. And it was simply the sanctuary lamp. You know what that is? The light that burns in the church all the time to remind us that Christ is present 24 seven. And on that night, when I was fearful and when the church seemed terribly dark, the single flame of that candle seemed to dissipate the darkness and almost the, the, the red color of the flame warmed the, 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 the atmosphere as well. So that light burns in the church all the time, through dark and light, through good and bad, through happy and sad. God is always guiding us and protecting us, but sometimes we only notice when it is dark. And on that evening, again I say, that single flame dissolved my fear and soothed my anxiety, and the red, the red flame brightened and warmed the whole place. Now I've often sat in dark, empty churches since, often, willingly or unwillingly, and I've gazed on that light, and the flickering flame it reminds me of a finger, the finger of God, calling, coaxing, cajoling me uh, to know that God is present and to know God, that God's uh, presence dissipates fear, takes away anxiety, it brings warmth and reassurance. I know on campus here there are lots of kind of dark churches St. Mary's, for God's sake, you can go in there in the evening when, they, when the sun no longer shines through the, the beautiful stained glass and gaze on that light or on upper campus too. Uh, in fact, I shared this story with some students and the one person spoke about how she goes often to the, the, um, the church on upper campus and sits there in the quiet. So, first scene. Scene two, darkness in light. And I look around, I see a few people here that I've shared this story with before, so excuse the repetition. Anyway, my, my mother was killed 16 years ago. She was crossing the street in our local town and she was knocked down by a truck. The driver didn't see her and she was snuffed out in an instant. She was a small, frail lady 
and God sent a truck to bring her home. Something less dramatic would have done. I was in the airport in Rome on my way to Dublin for a conference, and in fact, my mother was on her way to Dublin to meet me. I had just passed through the security camera, or the security check, and when I picked up my mobile phone after it had gone through the, the x-ray thing, I knew there was something wrong because I had lots and lots of missed calls from my brothers, from a neighbor who was a policeman, uh, and, and from others. And of course, I, I tried to call my brothers, but the number was busy. I called the policeman, he answered and he said, call your brothers. Eventually, I got one of my brothers and he told me what had happened. And I'm not sure what happened then, but I, uh, I dropped my, uh, my boarding pass, my hand luggage, my passport, and I wandered aimlessly around the airport. Some kind person came and got me and brought me to the gate, and I was reunited with my property there. Life can be cruel. Things happen that we don't expect. A bright blue day that is harmless and nondescript can be changed radically, brutally, by circumstances beyond our control. And I know many of you have had, uh, have had more difficult and traumatic experiences, far more difficult. Moments when the bottom fell out of a, a seemingly secure and safe world. It happens all the time. The moment you are told, perhaps, that a, bi that a biopsy is positive. Your grandparent is terminal. Your parents are separating. Your friend has committed suicide. Your sister or brother is addicted. You're cut from the team. The promotion is not coming. The bank is foreclosing. It can go on and on. But allow me a question that I heard a holy person ask not, uh, on many occasions. What difference does our Christian faith make to the way we live? Do we live any differently from our family members, friends or neighbours who no longer believe and have a different faith? Now, I don't want to generalise, but oftentimes Christians treat uh, Christianity or their faith like a lucky charm, something to keep evil at bay, like a, like a rabbit's foot, okay, or whatever else it might be. And, uh, you know, kind of, I remember once uh, spending, a, uh, spending a wasting an afternoon watching a, a gospel channel, and the preacher was saying, if you tithe and if you pray, everything will be fine. Your, your, you, your, your kids will go to a good school, uh, the, you won't have to work for the government, everything will be, will, will be great. And if things don't happen to work out, it's probably because you don't pray enough or you don't tithe enough. In a sense, it's kind of uh, saying that, you know, kind of, uh, uh, this is what God asks you to do, and if you do it, God will deliver for you. And then when things don't work out, well, we think God is to blame. Some turn away in great anger in such moments. I fulfilled my part of the bargain. God let me down in fulfilling his. Now, it can be easy to make to ridicule such, a, such an example, but all of us should question if our faith is as pure as we would like to think it is, and particularly when moments of difficulty come by. All of you here know J.R.R. Tolkien, the author of Lord of the Rings and so much more. And again, some of you know that he coined the word eucatastrophe. Eucatastrophe. The prefix you means good. Catastrophe, as you know, means destruction or disaster. So a eucatastrophe is something apparently bad that is ultimately good. Tolkien was a man of deep Catholic faith, and he described the death of Jesus as a eu catastrophe. Indeed, you have to be a person of faith to appreciate the truth of this word. 
Good things come from difficult experiences. Perhaps even better, good things take the shape of difficult experiences. How do we know? Well, reflective experience tells us with time, with hindsight. And Christian faith assures us from the beginning with foresight. You catastrophe. Are you familiar with David Brooks? David Brooks, the New York columnist and commentator, and he, noticed, he noted that when we have difficult moments in life, we can be either broken or broken open. Broken or broken open. And there is a big difference between the two. We all know people who have been broken. They've endured some pain or grief. They get smaller, they get angrier, angrier resentful, and they lash out. Then they wither and die. Pain that is not transformed gets transmitted. But then other people are not broken, but broken open. And suffering's great power is that its interruption, when it interrupts our lives, it can make us better and stronger. It reminds us that we are not the person we thought we were. It reminds us that we are more. Suffering carves through what you thought was the floor of the basement of your soul and reveals a cavity below. Then it carves through that, revealing yet another cavity below that. You realize that there are depths to yourself that you never anticipated. Suffering purifies us, it makes us more authentic, it deepens our capacity to become more compassionate, more real, more loving. And so every year when the anniversary of my mother's death passes, you will forgive me if I say I miss her still. I speak with my siblings on the phone and we reassure each other that the one crushed by the wheels of a big truck is radiant and beautiful in God's presence. I would love to tell her about my new life in Boston, about BC, about good people like you, and I wish, I always wish she had known the granddaughter born to my sister six months after she died and who now bears her name. But then she knows that. Because like all who have died in Christ, she lives with us still. You catastrophe. Scene three, giving birth. Strange things happen when women get together. They do. Strange things happen when women get together. And that is particularly true of the Bible story, the visitation. You remember the story? On one level, it's a simple story. Mary is told by the angel Gabriel that she is to be the mother of God. She is also told that her older cousin Elizabeth is pregnant. So she comes to visit Elizabeth. She stays for a while and then she goes home again. What happens? They talk. There is no great drama, no action, no car chase, just conversation taking place in a home between women. Women talking. And on a deeper level, of course, it is clear that they are troubled women. Things hadn't worked out the way they had expected, and they are confused, disoriented, dismayed. Mary was to marry Joseph, but finds that she is pregnant beforehand. Elizabeth discovers that she is pregnant in her old age, and she is concerned and worried. So they talk and talk and talk. I don't know if you've ever noticed this in the Gospel of Luke, but Luke tells us they talked for three months. Now, coming as I do from a family of five aunts and no uncles, I have glimpsed something of what that means. It's not just that the phone is busy forever. 
it's something much more profound. It's not just that stories are told and retold, it's something deeper. It's more of a, a reverent opening and sharing of hearts. And I believe that women are very good at that. The women in today's gospel have something else in common. Both believe in God. They wanted to do what was right, what was good, what was holy. They believed, but circumstances put their faith to the test. How often circumstances do that. The unexpected comes knocking and we wonder if we'll cope. And when they meet each other as cousins and friends, the gospel reminds us that Mary and Elizabeth do so as women of faith, women filled with the Holy Spirit. And it is this, it is this that guarantees that their talking is not idle chatter, but represents women coming to terms with the concrete circumstances of their lives and trying to understand what God wants of them. The Gospel story tells us that Mary and Elizabeth came to terms with what was happening in their lives and rejoiced in what God has done. Together they sing a song. In Christian tradition we call it the Magnificat. The Almighty has done great things for me. Holy is God's name. Dark is turned to light, confusion is changed to courage, and fear is turned to hope. Why? All because of talking women. And I'm sure you've often walked into rooms when this was taking place. Times when a kitchen becomes a temple, when an ordinary table becomes an altar, when a cup of coffee and a slice of cake can make Jesus present. A place where worries can be shared and doubts aired. A place where we laugh until we cry and cry again until we laugh. A place where great pleasure is taken at small things. A safe place where we are accepted and loved and loved and assured of our goodness and encouraged to go on. Mary learns that she is pregnant and dashes off to visit Elizabeth. Why did Mary go? My own religious formation told me that Mary went to congratulate and to help her pregnant cousin who was older. Well, not everybody agrees with that interpretation. And some women assure me that this is a man's response. One woman said to me that Mary ran to Elizabeth to seek support from another woman, from another pregnant woman. So Mary went to Elizabeth not to help, but to be helped. Not to affirm, but to be affirmed. Not necessarily to assure, but to be assured. And to be honest with you, I have often sat in a dark and empty church, and I've contemplated the meeting of Mary and Elizabeth. In my mind's eye, the two pregnant women move closer to each other, and then they place a hand each on the, on the womb of the, of the other woman. It's a moment of intuition and faith, a profound knowing that God has been gracious in both their lives. Mary places one hand on Elizabeth's growing child and the other one on the child taking flesh within her. And fear gives way to joy and together they sing that beautiful hymn, Holy is God's Name. And as I have sat there contemplating their meeting, Mary, like that flickering flame, has beckoned me to draw near. She has invited me to put my hand on her stomach, 
to feel the life within. The Son who is Saviour, who is Lord of the world. And as I have reached out, afraid and nervous of what this encounter might bring, she, has t she took my hand and placed her own on top of it. And the other one she has placed on my heart. And as Mary believed that the child growing within her was the Son of God, I felt the assurance that the word in my heart and the life feeling in my gut was of God. And Mary always, always begins to sing, to hum, to hum her hymn of praise. And then her voice becomes stronger and stronger. And I have the courage to join in together with her and, and we sing, Holy is God's name. Mary and Elizabeth, two pregnant women, expectant in faith, filled with God's spirit, acknowledging God's plan for them and his divine purpose in each, each, in each one of them. I think it's a wonderful image of the church, for the church, for indeed for any Christian community that seeks to be the womb of God's presence in our world and reaffirm the call of discipleship in all its members. The story of the visitation is not a pious story about holy women. It's a story of solidarity, a story of support, a story of courage and faith. It's about visiting women, talking women, faith-filled women. It's about hopeful women, practical women, generous women. It's also about you and me. It's about mutual support. It's about affirmation. It's about reassuring each other of the wonderful plan that God holds out for each one of us. And that's why, as we recall this story this evening, we can give thanks to the God who, despite our human weakness and frailty, does great, great things for us. An Advent triptych, light in darkness, darkness in light, giving birth. You catastrophe, holy is God's name. Thank you.